There are some things in life you never have to be taught. If you throw something up, it'll eventually come down. And two solid objects can't pass through each other. That's why skills like juggling can be really hard to learn. Gravity is constantly putting the balls back down towards Earth. If I'm throwing a ball, I have to predict where it's going to end up. And since the objects can't pass through each other, I have to constantly keep them moving. As such, routines like this could take ages to learn. Now normally we don't really question why two objects can't pass through each other, but what actually is the physical process that stops this happening? Well, to find out, we'll head over to Anna. Juggling balls, in all matter, is made up of atoms. Atoms consist of very small particles which have charges that can be either positive, neutral or negative. Charged particles interact by the electrostatic force, which is one of the fundamental forces. It causes like charges to repel and opposite charges to attract. It's incredibly strong, being a million, 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 million times stronger than gravity for a pair of electrons. Due to electrostatic repulsion, an atom will only approach another until it reaches its distance of closest approach. After this point, the repulsion will have caused the atom to reverse its direction of motion. A real collision between atoms never actually occurs. The electric force thereby prevents objects from ever touching and therefore also from passing through each other. So now we understand that it's the electrostatic repulsion force that means that atoms and objects don't pass through each other. The atoms in my hand are being pushed away from the atoms in the wall, meaning my hand won't go through the wall. The electrons in the atoms of my hand and the electrons in the atoms of the wall repel each other. So they only get as close as that point of closest distance, the point of closest approach that we were talking about earlier. The exact same thing applies with my shoes to the ground. The atoms in my shoes are repelled by the atoms of the ground, meaning they don't touch, they just get very close. So that technically means that I'm floating. The same is true for you. If you're sat down or standing up right now, you're either floating above the chair or floating above the ground. Not by a lot, but just by a little bit, because those atoms aren't touching. Naturally, you may then ask, how do things like cutting work? Uh, how can things be cut if nothing ever touches? Well, that's because the forces between those two objects still exist. If you were to get a knife, for instance, and you wanted to cut a piece of fruit, the repulsion from the electrons in the knife to the electrons of the atoms in the orange, say, would still be strong enough to break the bonds of that orange and break the fruit apart. The exact same thing would apply with this juggling knife and my hand, for instance. If I was to mess this up and the knife was to end up on my hand, the force from the atoms, the repulsion force from the atoms of the knife would be strong enough to break apart the bonds of my skin, causing me to bleed. So, if I'm going to juggle three knives, I'm going to have to be very careful about it. Please do not try this at home. I have practiced this many times over many years to be able to be able to do this. I'm also a bit silly enough to try it in the first place. Please, please be careful. Right. Here we go. So the, the question now is, is there any situation where atoms do touch, where they can merge together? To find out, we'll head back over to Anna. Thanks, Andrew. When two atoms are at a high enough temperature to have sufficient energy to overcome the electrostatic repulsion between them and collide, the result is that they merge in what is known as fusion. The product of this reaction is the formation of an atom heavier than the two fusing atoms, one or more lighter particles, as well as the release of energy. With regards to the global problem of energy production, 
Fusion is currently the best known solution to the issue. It produces no greenhouse gases like coal power plants and no radioactive waste like the current nuclear power plants. In addition, the main fuel needed for fusion reactors, deuterium, which is a heavier version of hydrogen, is extremely abundant as it can be extracted from seawater, making it unlikely that we'll run out of fuel for fusion power production. Sadly, using fusion for power production on Earth is not yet a reality, and research into ways of producing efficient fusion power plants is still being conducted. However, the most important application of fusion does not occur on the Earth, but rather in the Sun. Fusion is how the Sun produces its energy and is therefore crucial for the existence of life on Earth. In the Sun, hydrogen atoms undergo a complicated series of fusion reactions in order to end up as helium, producing some lighter particles and releasing high-energy radiation in the process. For atoms to have the high energies required to collide and fuse, incredibly high temperatures are needed. If you do the calculations and estimate how high a temperature, you end up with a result that's about a hundred times the temperature of the sun's core. The sun actually isn't hot enough for fusion. So then, how can this all occur? Let's pass over to Andrew. Thanks, Anna. And to see how this fixes the problem in the sun, we're going to have to talk about something called quantum tunneling. Now, let's say this ball represents an atom, and this cup represents a barrier to that atom say, the electrostatic potential from earlier. Now, we understand in classical mechanics, there's no way that this ball could travel through the cup and end up on the table below. That would be ridiculous. Classically, impossible. But in quantum mechanics, there's a chance, albeit incredibly small, for the particle to travel through the cup and end up on the table below. And that's quantum tunneling. The idea of an atom, a particle, travelling through a barrier that classically it cannot get through. It doesn't even matter what that barrier is. It could be the table, for instance, and tunnelling can still occur. It could be, I don't know, uh, my hand, and there's a chance for it still to happen. It's just that some barriers are easier to tunnel through than others. And this is the joys of quantum tunnelling. The idea of the impossible, impossible, truly impossible, becoming possible. So how does this work? Well, it's the idea that an atom exists in a quantum state of probability, as in it has a chance to be in any position at any given time. So the next question then becomes, well, how can we use this? Can we know when tunneling is going to occur? Well, no, not really. It's all probabilistic. It's all a chance to happen. So if I take the ball, put it under this cup, what is the chance then it's going to travel from this cup and up under this one? Well, the answer is very low. In fact, it's near on zero. However, if you were to keep taking a measurement over and over again, keep going back to it, eventually you'll see that the particle does indeed tunnel just like that. And this is the amazing thing about quantum mechanics and quantum tunneling, to be precise. We can extend this idea a little bit further. Because we've already just said that it's all about probability, the chance of it being somewhere else, that means there is a chance for the particle to end up anywhere. Its position can be unknown. Its position can change. So we take the ball, put it under the centre cup just there. We can play the classic game of one ball and three cups and see in, if we can track that one ball. See if you can keep your eye on it. So, the question is, classically, where would the ball be? Well, typically, I think, I would say at least, the ball was under this cup, but it's not. Maybe no surprise there. So maybe it's under this cup? No, not, not there either. This is because in our quantum example here, the particle was able to tunnel, its position was changed because of probability, to be under the centre cup. So what we've learned here is that there is a chance for any particle at any time for its position to change. It's a very small chance that will happen. But barriers can then be surpassed because there is a chance that it could end up on the other side. And to see how this fixes the problem in the sun, we'll head 
Back over to Anna. Let's try to visualize this in terms of collisions between atoms. Due to quantum effects, you can't actually talk about the position of a particle. Rather, you have to talk about the probability of a particle being in a certain position, which will vary depending on the position. This means that there is a chance that the atom can go through the barrier despite not having enough energy, and therefore a probability that the atoms will collide. So then fusion can occur in the sun after all, as long as we get lucky and the atom tunnels through the barrier. However, the probability of this occurring is extremely low, and the stronger the barrier, the lower the probability. Let's talk about how likely, or in this case how insanely unlikely it is, for a hydrogen atom to tunnel through a potential barrier and then fuse. To do this, we need to put probability into scale. Say you have two playing cards. How many different ways are there to arrange those cards? Well, there's two. How about three cards? Well, there's six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Say I was then shuffle these three cards. What would be the odds of getting the configuration I wanted? Say, one, two, three in order. Well, because there are six different ways these cards can be arranged, and I want one of those ways, the odds would be one in six. What if I was to have four cards and I wanted this order? Well, with four cards, you can arrange it 24 different ways. So the odds would become one in 24. Five, it becomes one in 120. Six, one in 720. And with seven, just seven cards, it becomes one in 5,040. The chance of getting the configuration you want decreases rapidly as you increase the number of options. So if I was to take now just over half the deck, about 27 cards, what would be the odds of getting this configuration if I was to give it a bit of a shuffle? It'd actually be one in 10 to the 28. That's a one with 28 zeros after it. Or similar to winning the lottery four times in a row. It's also the probability for a hydrogen atom to tunnel in the sun. So if the chance for a hydrogen atom to undergo fusion is so small, why is the sun still shining? It has to do once again with extremely large numbers. Although the chance for one atom to undergo fusion is incredibly small, if we had two atoms, the chance is now twice as high that at least one of them manages to tunnel. Think of it as having two different attempts to pass through a barrier. If we were to have three atoms, the chance is now three times as high, and so on and so forth. The sun has 10 to the 58 atoms, or roughly the number of ways to shuffle 46 cards. This is an incomprehensibly large number, but now there are so many atoms, it becomes very likely that any given second, at least one atom will be able to tunnel. In fact, every second, 10 to the 38 hydrogen atoms fuse, or the equivalent number of ways to shuffle 34 different cards. So it's just the sheer number of hydrogen atoms that takes the incredibly unlikely process of quantum tunneling into the common life-giving process that takes place in the sun. One exciting new avenue of research is random number generation. Random numbers are important for most of modern life. Anytime you access the internet, your data is being kept secure by large random numbers. A random number is used to make a key to scramble your data, so that only people with access to the key can never unscramble it. The problem is that humans are really bad at making up random numbers. Ask somebody for a number between 1 and 10, and they're most likely to say 7. And computers don't have the ability to create true random numbers because their code can be predicted and unraveled. If you were to know all the conditions about the situation and the machine that generated the number, you could, in theory, predict future numbers. So something that cannot be predicted needs to exist. A true random number generator. Since quantum tunneling is a totally random process, it could be used to make large random numbers. If you measure particles passing near a barrier, you could assign a 1 or a 0 if they tunnel or not, and from this, create a number from binary code. This could revolutionise computing and cryptography by making random numbers that can never be predicted. 
And that concludes our look at quantum tunneling, a bit of fusion, and why the sun works. From everybody here at Quantum Magic and Lancaster University, thank you for watching.